it blew up. Neoliberalism created a dominant finance sector in the West and told that sector to go enrich itself and that that sector would enrich everybody else. And in the process, it crashed the world economy in a way that, as I will argue, has cancelled the future of an entire generation. So we're left with what the Nomura economist Richard Kuh calls a balance sheet recession in which fiscal stimulus, zero interest rates, plus the $6 trillion worth of global money printing that's gone on under quantitative easing can only do one thing, and that's just keep the patient alive. It can't cure the disease. The Western political elite can't address this prolonged stagnation because they can't bear to do any of the things that would end the depression. And what are they? They're quite hard. Write off the debts, causing what? Bank nationalizations. Bankruptcies, the seizure of large amounts of, of empty property. They can't do that. They, they don't want to inflate them away. They can't bear to do that because the electoral base of nearly all democratic parties of the center are older people, and if you inflate away their savings, they tend to get angry. They, they don't want to step back from globalization and protect their own, po their own populations against downward pressure on wages and downward pressure on conditions because to do that would be to step away from what they believe kept the whole situation going. So they can't actually even address it. They're left staring at the old model and insisting that it does work. That is the, that is the source of all the tension, I would argue, um, in the economics of the present. Um, the problem is the dynamo of that, mo that old model, the free market, the financialized economy, is knackered. Um, on top of which, it's rapidly losing social legitimacy. Because all attempts to make that model work without solving the fundamentals that it was based on, the global imbalances between China and the USA and all of that, just leads in one direction, towards austerity. And I don't just mean fiscal austerity, that is spending cuts and tax, interest, tax rises. It, the, a wider austerity which involves reducing the wages, welfare, and benefits, and labor rights of the whole Western workforce. That is the only solution that works if you want to actually keep neoliberalism going. It doesn't, I would argue, guarantee it will keep going, because who is going to buy uh, the stuff in Argos? Who is going to buy the stuff in Walmart um, if, if, they, if they have um, Indian and Chinese level wages? We'll come to this. But the austerity measures that were then brought in hit first, as you know, public sector workers, users of public services, and then the welfare dependent, and finally with quantitative easing, which depresses the rate of return on savings, the, the, the elderly and pensioners and future pensioners. It's affected all of them. But one massively important group has been dealt not just a tactical or cyclical setback, but a strategic one. In the book, I call them graduates without a future. The first generation in the West since the 1930s who are certain that, for many of them, their lives will be poorer than those of their parents. They leave college with 30, 40, 50,000 pounds or dollars worth of debt. The jobs they get when they leave college, as the famous Santa Cruz communique from an absent future, written in occupation in 2009, tells us the same jobs that you do while you're on campus, interning. Sorry, interning, barista, waiting tables, quietly, not, not very well um, documented, sex work, okay? That's the jobs you do wh when you're at college and you do it when you leave college unless you're very lucky. Working for free when you get your first job or the minimum wage. And there's no way onto the housing ladder and the ladder's now horizontal anyway. And in retirement, the pension schemes are gone if you're in the USA the healthcare schemes are gone, so it's, you know, don't bother getting old because in addition to that, the problem's going to be for them, for the generation leaving college now, that the retirement age is going to be 65, 67, 70, plus 70 um, as the crisis drags on, as one decade drags into the next. You can... Add in, of course, the specific grievances, country by country, medieval attempts to roll back reproductive rights, endless wars conducted by drones against civilians, racism everywhere, torture as the default option, not just for anti-terrorism, but for the policing of minorities. Go to Greece, that is what you see on a daily basis. 
In Europe, relentless austerity of the kind that forces you to eat or pay the rent, to forget cars, to forget, as I found in the Spanish village of San Miguel, where I did a documentary there, even bothering with a driver's license. Because as they said to us, why have a driver's license? Why pay 50 euros a year when you're never going to have a car? As I've traveled around USA and Europe to report on all this, it's become clear to me that a whole generation is being forced to live as drifters, to relive the plots of those 1930s movies, um, you know, to get on a bus, to go and look for work, to migrate, to sofa surf, to enter relationships that are, in fact, a stark compromise between love and economics. That is the reality for the generation that has revolted. And it, took, and it goes a, large, a long way to explaining for me why they have revolted. And it's the easy bit of the answer, why did it kick off everywhere? Not simple economic downturn or economic grievance, but what is perceived by a generation as the theft of their economic future. Now, over the past two years, I've become sick of hearing that this movement has petered out and failed. Something far more prosaic has happened to it. It's been massively repressed. Tear gas fired indiscriminately into crowds in Athens. Rubber bullets in Madrid. Tasers and pepper spray on campuses across America. That's Berkeley. Uh, people were hospitalized for that. Uh, Non-lethal policing is highly effective against people who are doing non-violent action. It tends to clear them out and get rid of them. But do not think that it clears away the ideas that put them sitting on the concrete um, in the first place. Uh, what it does is it pushes those who don't want to get their heads broken or their mouths force open and pepper spray pe sprayed into them um, to become sullen, silent, passive, passively resistant, to move towards a resistance of ideas and culture and, if anything, small granular projects of small scale ambition to have a squat, to open a little cafe where their mates can be. That's really where that movement has gone. Or, as in Greece, it forces them into what the Greeks call anomy, anomic breakdown, where society just ceases to function and people begin just to give up. They embrace the, the kind of comfort of being homeless, uh, sort of being rather hopeless. Um, they roll, roll a joint, sit on the floor of a squat and stare into each other's eyes. It's a great book by Laurie Penny, the English writer, uh, who records her experience of this last summer in Greece called Discordia. That's what's happened to the movement. The crisis of neoliberalism, compounded by the total failure to emerge within mainstream politics of any alternative to what I've just described, simply leaves that generation facing the question either on the streets like this or in their squats or in their multiply occupied modern slums, the student house, which after a few years becomes the young teacher's house or the young lawyer's house, where every room is occupied and there's no living room. Yeah? They sit there and they simply ask, what does capitalism have on offer to secure my future? So that's part one. That's why. Part one of why. Now, in the book, those of you who've read the book know, will know that I, I do draw a parallel here with uh, what the historian Taine wrote about the French Revolution. Taine um, looked at the students of his day in the mid-19th century and said, well, you know, you know what? Students are always discontented. In the empty, and as are graduates, in the empty offices of the, of the, uh, the poor lawyer or the poor doctor uh, in the empty waiting room, uh, is a Robespierre just waiting to happen. But Taine said, why then in 1789 did it go beyond the normal discontent? Why did the young embrace Jacobinism, revolutionary uh, republicanism? And his conclusion was because all the old barriers of society had disintegrated um, and, and w the, the, the Robespierre's in waiting became the real Robespierre's, Danton's and Marat. Now, I think we're, what we're looking at with this movement is a lot, is very similar to, to what I've just described there. 
with, as I wrote last year, one big addition, that in every garret, in every depressed graduate's um, bedroom, there is a laptop and a broadband connection. And it makes a difference. I recently rewatched the rushes of me uh, outside Lehman Brothers on, um, on the 15th of September uh, 2008 when it went bust. That's Fifth Avenue, there's Lehman. Um, two things struck me. First of all, the guy in the suit does not yet know how badly capitalism is going to come unstuck. Second, all the technology on that sidewalk is now obsolete. There they are, people taking photographs of Lehman as it goes bust on their Nokias, on their Sony Ericsson's, on their Motorola flip phones. Do you remember those? Uh, yeah. Cast your mind back, yeah? Because um, it's only 2008. On that day, Facebook had 100 million users. It now has 1 billion. On that day, Twitter had 4 million accounts. There are now 100 million. In the four years since Lehman Brothers, the iPhone has conquered the world, and so has the Android. As for the plain old internet, 1.5 billion people had it in September 08. 2.4 billion people have it now, which is 34% of the whole global population. But remember, that's an underestimation, because there's a great story about an internet cafe owner in Addis Ababa, because the, the sociologist said to them, can we come and look um, at, at the, at the um, history bar on your internet browser so we can work out what Ethiopian um, internet users are using your internet cafe for? And he said, you've got to be joking. Um, all they do is stand outside the door and say to me, have you got Facebook? Okay? There are twice as many Facebook accounts in Ethiopia as there are PCs linked to the internet. Okay? So... The world has changed, and we are not looking at arithmetical change here. Uh, that is the Facebook uh, billion. Um, and you can see, literally, if I just pause this, literally, that's Lehman Brothers going bust. That's what the world was then. Facebook now is as big as the internet was then. And Facebook and these other technologies are social media. But before, we do, before we look at what it's done to protest and ideology and politics. It's just worth stepping back and reminding ourselves that it's part of a bigger moment. The digital, digital comms revolution is just one part of a wider technological revolution that's been underway since the middle of the 90s, which is affecting commerce, goodbye Jessups this week, manufacturing, goodbye workers in many car factories, uh, hello robots, okay? The speed of scientific discovery is, 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 in, is increasing. And of course, finance, completely impossible to have a Lehman Brothers or a Lehman Brothers crash without the computing uh, technology that that, that that market was based on. What I argued in 2009, and I'll stick by this with some conviction now, is that we're at the beginning of what should be the fifth big wave of technological innovation in the history of capitalism. The rollout and commoditization and cheapening of new technologies from medicine to genetics to robots and smartphones. This is a classic sign, a signal of the start of a 50-year upswing, according to the long wave theories um, advocated uh, by those who followed the Soviet economist uh, Nikolai Kondratiev. But at the end of the last wave, during the last half of the 20th century, policymakers and economists discovered how to disrupt the wave. By printing money, by moving away from what was left of uh, the gold standard or fixed currencies um, in 1971, they opened the possibility for central banks to create money in response to every crisis, to create money in a way that was never possible before, and that therefore, with the money flowing around since 1971, I would argue there have been greater, greater amplitude of crashes, of financial bubbles that then burst, they, they can then always stop the bubble turning into an absolute 30-style slump by printing more and turning the taps on again. They did, did it after the Asian crisis in 97, after the dot-com crash in 2001, and they're doing it now. The problem is, long-term, historically, it creates an absolutely unprecedented situation. It creates, 